Okay. Can everybody see the beginning of the presentation, the presentation title? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, awesome. All right, well, um, like Susan said, my name is Callie Cronin-Sams. I work for the DEP and I work with the Save Our Streams program. And the Save Our Streams program is out of the Division in Water, of Water and Waste Management. And we work with the Watershed Improvement Board, the Basin Coordinators, and with volunteers throughout the state to do assessments of stream water quality to find out um, you know, if their local stream is healthy and if not, um, learn what they might be able to do to help it become healthier or clean up pollution sources. And one of the ways we do that through the Save Our Streams program is looking at uh, what is living in the stream and that can tell us a little bit about the water quality. There we go. So you guys probably already know this, uh, but this slide is just showing you if you don't already know, and I think you guys have all typed in the chat probably, the chat bar is there and Susan will be keeping an eye on that. So if you have any questions as we go along, uh, just type them in there and I'll try to pause uh, from time to time and we can take those questions. So um, it's not just the volunteers, our scientists at DEP and our natural resource professionals are also using this methodology um, by looking at the benthic macroinvertebrates to determine stream health. And they work in our watershed assessment branch of the DEP. But not only them, uh, you can get involved as well. And I hope you do. So you'll learn a little bit today. And if you like what you learned today, either with your school or a club or a watershed organization, you could start doing this kind of monitoring in uh, the stream near you. So first off, what are benthic macroinvertebrates? Um, does anyone want to take a guess? If so you can put that into the chat. I'm trying to see, I guess because I'm sharing my screen, Susan, I'm not seeing the chat. So um, maybe you, so far you can give me a, yeah. okay, you just give me a uh, heads up if you see anything. Okay, um, let's see, Harmony says the water bugs. Uh-huh, so a lot of them are insects, yes, and in the water, absolutely. So benthic just means they're found in the bottom of the stream. Macro, as means we can see them with our naked eye. We don't need a, a microscope to be able to see them. And invertebrates means without a backbone. And many of them are insects, but not all. Okay. And so here you can see some folks are out in the stream. They're using some different kinds of nets. Uh, the gentleman over on the far right have a two pole kick net. Um, and over on the far left, they have a rectangular net. So there's different equipment that you can use, but it's all uh, fairly readily available. And if you go through the certification with Save Our Streams uh, with your group, we'll send you a kit to get you started with the nets and some of the other equipment that you would need. And other things that you can use when you're collecting the benthic macroinvertebrates, we'll just call them BMIs sometimes, are simple things like ice cube trays. So that center picture uh, they're using for sorting and it's just an ice cream or <laughs> ice cube tray sitting on top of another white tray. So the equipment needed is really pretty easy to get your hands on. And you can see some groups identifying what they found. And then you get a little uh, snapshot in the tray itself of some of those uh, aquatic insects. So why, why are we collecting them? Why do they matter? Well, they're useful because they can be found in most streams and rivers throughout West Virginia and beyond. 
Uh, they provide food and for fish and other wildlife. Uh, they're also, some of them are very sensitive to pollution. And so that can help us determine how healthy the stream is. If you're finding the ones that are the most sensitive, then you know you have a pretty healthy stream. They're also fairly easy to collect and identify. So, um, you know, you don't have to have a college degree or master's degree or um, have finished uh, school yet. You can start learning how to identify these right away and um, be helping your community uh, protect your watershed. And here's just a little bit more on that. Um, like we said, they can be found in most of our streams and rivers here in West Virginia. And there's a broad range that we can find. You see there in the bottom right, 133 families, over 540 genera. Um, again, they're an important food source for other wildlife and fish. Um, let's see. Oh, another important thing is um, sometimes if you're just going out, you're doing water quality uh, monitoring and if you are collecting water samples to be sent to the lab for chemical analysis, that's just going to give you a snapshot of that particular day. Uh, but the nice thing about collecting the BMIs is that you can learn if you're finding a lot of these sensitive species, you know that not only is the water healthy on that particular day when you're in the stream, but it's probably been in good shape for the past year or so because uh, they have a long life cycle, sometimes, you know, more than a year. Okay, so we're going to dive in here soon and start taking a look at some of these animals. And uh, I just want to show you down at the bottom of the slide, you can see one of the scales that we use and you can see the, um, it has the tolerance level that's telling you how tolerant or how much they are able to handle pollution, uh, whether that's from sediment or mud or even something like temperature. So and it's not necessarily a pollution, but it's also their tolerance to changes in their habitat. Um, so for instance, if a high temperature, the temperature is out of the normal range, that would be something that would affect the sensitive species as well, in addition to pollutants. So you can see on the bar for this, in this just example one, uh, the highlighted in that light pink color, that's where these uh, would lie. So very low tolerance to moderate. And then on the bottom, it also shows you the size in millimeters. Um, this is more when you're starting to uh, be out in the field and you're capturing them yourself. It's just going to give you some helpful tips. So if you want to place them in the same direction as the guide that you're looking at, that's going to help you with ID. Um, making sure to also consider not just how they look, but their movements, because some of them move in specific ways, and that can give you clues as well. And then also color and size change. So, you know, the size of the organism is going to change depending on its age. So that's not necessarily the best um, measure and the color can vary as well. So our first one are ephemeroptera and mayflies. They have three pairs of legs, a single hook at the end. Uh, they generally have three, but sometimes two tails. And they have gills attached to the abdomen, which is another good clue. And as you can see up on the scale, they are, they have a very low tolerance. So that means they're a good indicator species. If you're finding a lot of mayflies, there's a good chance you're in a healthy stream. And they move in different ways. So some are swimmers, some are clingers, some are crawlers, and some are burrowers. And then you have a few examples, both the drawings and the photos. So take a look at that. Those are our mayflies. And then our stoneflies. So you see stoneflies have a very low tolerance for pollution as well. And uh, they have also have three pairs of legs. So six legs, three pairs, six legs total. 
uh, two hooks at the end, two tail uh, filaments, no gills attached to the abdomen. So that's a good way to distinguish um, between the stoneflies and the mayflies is that they do not have gills along the sides of their bodies. Um, and some generally with mayflies, you can spot those gills and uh, stoneflies do not. And so in addition to the tails, that can be useful because um, like I'd said with the mayflies, sometimes a mayfly uh, might lose one of their tails and not all of them have three tails. Um, so that's not always, you know, a sure way to identify them by the tails. And then our caddis flies and caddis flies are really cool. Um, they live in different ways. Some of them build cases and we're gonna watch a little video on that next. Others are free living um, and some even spin nets. So they spin like a silk net that can capture uh, their prey in the water. It's pretty cool. So caddis flies also have a very low um, tolerance level to pollution. So we often include those, we call that the three, the EPT, the Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera are those three indicator species where if you're finding those, that's a good sign you probably have a really healthy stream. So before we move forward though, I'm gonna see if I can get this video to play. And this is gonna show you the caddis fly and a case building caddis fly, it's pretty cool. To us, it's a tranquil mountain stream. But if you're a bug living on those algae covered rocks in the water, it's a constant underwater hurricane. Powerful currents, debris swirling all around you. How do you survive? Well, you build a shelter. All you need are some raw materials and a little tape. That's right, tape. This is the larva of the caddisfly. This insect has evolved a tool that's eluded us humans so far, tape that stays sticky underwater. As winged adults, caddisflies are a favorite food for trout. Artificial lures mimic them in painstaking detail. But they spend most of their lives as larvae in shallow, turbulent water, which is rich in the oxygen they need. And though its head and legs are covered in a thick layer of insect armor, or chitin, its soft white lower body is more exposed to the elements, and especially to any passing predators. So the caddisfly has figured out how to build a case for ballast, protection, and camouflage. It does this by binding together pebbles with a special silk that looks and acts a lot like double-sided waterproof tape. Every case starts with one pebble. It's like the cornerstone of a building. The caddisfly adds more pebbles one by one, like a bricklayer putting up a wall using its tape as the mortar. When he brushes the surface with his mouth, that's his tape dispenser working. It's in a gland under his chin. He's sealing the pebble down. These flies are very particular about their building stones. Only the right shape and size will do. If it doesn't fit, it's out. When he finds a match, he fits it into place. Once he tapes down the basic shape of the case, he seals it up from the inside in a series of barrel roll maneuvers. The problem with our tape is that when it's wet, it loses its stick. But caddisfly tape is selective. It sticks to pebbles, but not to water. What's more, the ribbon itself is like a rubber band. It can stretch to twice its size and return to the same shape but it snaps back slowly. It's a rubber band that moves like molasses. So the case is resilient, no quick movements. That's a lot safer for the vulnerable larva living inside. 
bioengineers have started to figure out how we could make our own caddisfly silk, maybe as a kind of internal surgeon's tape, to replace the metal and string that we use to patch people up now. The magical underwater tape of the caddisfly, another example of how evolution finds radical solutions to everyday problems. Like how to survive in a hurricane. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, the caddis flies are really, really pretty cool. I've even seen um, someone kind of an entrepreneur, very creative has, this was in West Virginia too, where she was capturing caddis flies that could do this, the case building caddis flies. And then uh, she had a stream bed, a simulated stream bed built where she was putting gemstones into uh, their habitat. And then they were building these cases uh, with the gemstones and when they had exited their case she would take what they left behind the case and turn them into um, necklaces and earrings and stuff it was pretty neat so uh, but really amazing creatures and can tell us a lot um, about how we can engineer um, different things so biomimicry bioengineering and action um, Susan, while we're paused, are there any questions or anything come in before I move forward? No, no questions, but that was a really cool video. And I like <laughs> what you were talking about with the jewels. That's so neat to think to yeah. do that. And I was shaking my head. Yes, I could hear you, but I didn't think to unmute. To unmute. Oh, Sorry about that's that. That's fine. <laughs> Somebody chimed in, so thank you. I kind of wondered yeah. if she heard you. or um, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, let's see. Okay, so here's some more caddis flies, um, just to give you another, another look at these guys. So they don't all, all the case builders don't necessarily use stones. You can see on the bottom left, they've used some kind of sticks or vegetation. So often when you find these, they're um, stuck to the bottoms of rocks in the stream bed. And if you didn't know to look for them, you might just think, oh, there's just some rock or there's just some sticks stuck to the bottom of this rock. Um, but most likely it's a caddis fly living inside. Okay, and odonata, so dragonflies and damselflies also have three pairs of legs. Uh, large eyes, you can see with the dragonfly, especially over on that far right, a larger body, thicker, abdomen um, and they have a lower uh, tolerance for pollution in some of their species but some are very tolerant so not necessarily considered an indicator species um, but one that you would bump into most likely. Coleoptera so I don't know how many of you out there have ever been in the stream and bumped into a water penny but they're pretty cool um, so you can see the water penny so these are beetles, also insects, so three pairs of legs, um, body usually covered by a hard exoskeleton, most commonly connected is, uh, collected is the water penny, but also the riffle beetles and whirligig beetles. Um, they're also pretty tolerant, so they don't necessarily tell you if it's, uh, you know, a healthy stream, but it's good to find uh, aquatic life in general. And then how many of you bumped, have bumped into a helgrimet before? I know it seems like people who go fishing especially know the helgrimet. So that's the one on the left and the alder fly, megaloptera, three pairs of legs, large pinching jaws, and eight pairs of filaments attached to the sides of the abdomen. And also moderately tolerant. And diptera, so true flies, segmented, segmented body. And the only aquatic insect without fully developed legs. So you notice you're not seeing uh, fully developed legs like we were with the other insects. Very diverse order, but also extremely you know, large range of tolerancy. So some are um, 
you know, have a very low tolerance, but others, you know, you would find even in very polluted streams or very muddy streams. And so included in those will be your crane flies, your midges, your black flies. And here's another look at those individuals. Just letting you take a look before I move on. A black fly also, if you collect those or if you see them attached to a rock, they will tend to attach uh, their bottom of their body to the bottom of the stream bed or if you've collected them to the tray. And so that's another kind of a clue that you have a black fly. In that middle picture, you can kind of see that. Middle, top middle, I should say. So all flies here. And then crustacea. So I know we've all seen crayfish before when we've been in the stream. So um, even though, of course, not insects, uh, these are also found in the bottoms of streams and therefore are benthic macroinvertebrates and would be included in a Save Our Stream survey. Um, they have just basically a moderate tolerance for pollution, even going up into high. Um, so they can be a little more tolerant than some other species. And also, in addition to the crayfish, you see the scud and the side swimmers and the aquatic sow bug. And I think we have some pictures next. There you go. I think that sow bug, how they kind of attach to the vegetation is pretty cool. Okay, and then worms too. So you would find worms living in the stream down in the mud or the sediment especially. And many of them are extremely tolerant. So even in a stream that has a heavy sediment pollution um, or just doesn't have that rocky bottom that's important for some of the other insect species, you would probably still find the worms and leeches and flatworms. And here's a look at these guys. <laughs> and then bivalvia, so clams and mussels. We also have those, sometimes we think of those as something you would find when you're at the ocean or at the Chesapeake Bay or other bays, but we actually have oops, um, clams and mussels right here in our freshwater uh, systems here in West Virginia. So in our streams and rivers here. And everyone's probably familiar with how they look. And they're kind of in the middle range there for their tolerance for pollution. And just note that down at the bottom, you know, we have some of the richest diversity of freshwater mollusks on the planet. So that's pretty cool. Over 650 species of snails and 300 species of freshwater mussels have been described so far. And gastropoda, so those are our snails. Um, and you will find these in the streams as well. Moderate range for tolerance again. So if we were out at the stream and you were, we were collecting them, we were using the nets as you saw at the beginning, doing our little stream stomp. And, and <clears throat> you pour them out through a bus bucket, strain them and start picking with forceps and seeing what you've collected and using those sorting trays. And as you're sorting, whether you're using an ice cube tray or other type of tray, you just start to group them together. So you have all the stone flies together, all the may flies together, all the caddis flies and on through. And you're provided with a data sheet like you see on the screen um, now. And you count, you can either do a full count or at the bottom of the screen, you see the abundance. So you can just do estimate estimates instead of a full count. Uh, so you indicate whether it's abundant, common, or rare. Um, and you can see, you know, abundant being more than 50 that you would estimate, or five to 50 being common or rare, you found less than five, but at least one. And so you would put those into the box. And then we have a Excel sheet or spreadsheet where you enter those in and it will still calculate your stream score for how healthy your stream is, even if you've just done the estimate 
or you can do a full count and enter the numbers and it will still calculate your stream index score uh, with the full count as well. So you can kind of choose based on how much time you have and uh, you know how deep you wanna go into the analysis. And um, then once you've you know, filled all this in, we have an online portal where you can enter it online. Uh, we also have the spreadsheet, so you can do it that way You could, if you prefer. And you can also just write it down. So you could print out these data sheets and you could either scan it and email it in or even mail it in. So there's a lot of different ways. Um, once you've taken the training that uh, volunteers can submit their data to our volunteer data database. We have a quick question from Harmony sure. and I'm not sure if you can answer or not. It says, what are those water bugs that are small and black that you find in a pool and see them in streams and how do they live in chlorine? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. What I'll have to, after. I will, Harmony, I'll try to do a little research on that and see if there I can find out. There's a lot of um, bugs that are like in, running around in um, swimming bowls. In pools too, yeah. So that would tell me that they're pretty tolerant of a species and if they're able to, you know, the chlorine doesn't bother them. I will look into that. That is a good question. I don't know specifically which one that would be, I'm sorry. But I will try to find out. Okay. And so, and then here's just a chart. It's just um, kind of shows you, not only do you have either your abundance or your full count, but you say how many different kinds. So you wouldn't just say mayflies. If you notice you've got several different kinds of mayflies, you would indicate that too. So that's that far right um, column. And it all gets added up. And in the end, kind of over on the right side towards the middle though, you see there's a stream score. And so you would, based on what you find in the stream, you'll come up with your stream score. It'll calculate it for you, or you can go through the calculations if you like to do that, do some math. And then based on that score, you can see whether your stream would be optimal, which is the best, the highest category, most healthy of streams. Suboptimal, still, that's still pretty good, uh, but just not quite as good as optimal. And then either marginal or even poor. Uh, with those lower lower ranges. So most likely, if you haven't found, for instance, any of the mayflies, stoneflies, or um, caddisflies, you might get a score that's poor or even marginal. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you're finding lots of them um, and a lots of different kinds, which means you have a species richness, a lot of diversity, in addition to abundance, which is your count, just uh, raw numbers. Um, so if you have both of those, like a diversity of species and you're finding a lot of them as well, and they include those sensitive species like the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, then you're probably gonna get a really great score, like optimal or suboptimal. And um, then based on that, you can kind of start thinking about, well, either this is a great stream or if you get a lower score, um, you can start investigating, well, I wonder what is keeping this, you know, from being great habitat for these um, BMIs for the benthic macroinvertebrates and kind of looking at the watershed as a whole to try to see what could be impacting it. And then you might choose to even um, to in, take action with your group or encourage action from others. If it's an outside group that might be affecting, if it's human activity, something that you might be able to um, urge action to improve the watershed and improve water quality. Okay, so <laughs> now I was gonna let you guys take a little turn at this. So if Susan can drop a couple of links into the chat box, let me get back to that slide. They are there, the field awesome. guide quiz. Okay, so that first one, and I'm just gonna see if I can get it to open on mine too. You guys can just click it right in the chat box. No, it doesn't want to.
you go along with me and close out the caddis fly video. So that first link should take you to uh, the identify identification guide. So this is going to help you doing a little bit of ID. Has everyone got that up? Anyone not finding it? And once you have it, and open that second link and it's going to bring you um, to this page. So it's a PDF and you see it's got the images for the BMI ID. And we're not going to go through and do all of them, but we'll do a couple here together. And then um, if you complete this at home and you submit it by email and you also include your address, then I can send you guys some goodies if you submit that in. And I'll also provide you some feedback. I, I can tell you if you got the right answers and that kind of thing. So does everyone have the quiz up on their screen? Susan, are you seeing, I don't, I can't see them. So are you getting any um, kind of? Yeah, nobody's commenting. I mean, if you're having trouble, let us know or turn your video on to let us know. Um, I just clicked on the link and it's links and they both work. Okay. Awesome. They should be able to just hover your mouse over them and click and <laughs> they should take you there. Okay. So let's start with this top middle. And I'm just going to give you guys a few minutes. So you can see if you've got it open, when you click down, that's why I use this quiz because it narrows it down a little bit for you. <laughs> so you've got some choices down there and this is a pretty easy one, I hope, because we, um, well, so just see which one you think that is. And once you think you know the answer, go ahead and pop that into the chat box. And you can use that field guide if you need a little help. Do we have anybody who's rang in, Susan? No, no one's guessed Not yet. Not yet. It's like we learn everything, but then we're like, how to do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, that field guide would probably be helpful. And if you have the, if you have the little quiz up, if you can see how you can just drop it down with that arrow, that'll narrow it down to a few choices. Uh, Harmony said hers is still loading. Oh, okay. Give a little more time then. So which one are you asking for the first one? The one in the center on the top row, the one right in the center. Oh, uh, okay. It kind of looks like a, it's like, it says there's like a, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's just like in the, in the field guide, it says some humpless case thing. I'm not sure, but it kind of looks like that. Well, I heard case, so that's a good um, start. It, it, it does. says case building cast, caddis fly. Uh-huh. Yes, you're right. So that's a, one of the ones similar to what we saw in the video. However, this caddis fly appears to be using, you know, bits of grass as opposed to the stone. So in the video, uh, that caddis fly uh, was using stones, but this one looks like it's been using bits of grass. And that's right. It is a ca case building caddis fly. So. so it uses anything that it like fits correctly for it? 
Yes, and then different species too, based on where they live and what's available. Yes, they can use different materials that are surrounding it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this Harmony, one, Harmony got that one right too. She said, "Awesome." This, yeah, she remembered the stones. Oh, Thanks. perfect. Yeah, great. So, if we were doing this quiz, then we would just select the case building caddisfly. You see, it shows up there now underneath of the picture. So let's move over next to it. So the far right, top right, and if you can see my cursor, kind of this one over here. And I'll give you guys a couple of minutes and use that field guide and see if you can identify this one. We have a guess of dragonfly from Harmony. Awesome. Yes, it is a dragonfly. Anisoptera. So it's a larger one down there. So we would collect that. Okay, so now how about top left? This one's a little bit trickier. Let's see what you think on that one. And you don't have to get into maybe the kinds, is but it, just um oh sorry. Yeah, you go ahead. Is it a uh, I think okay, yeah, I think it's a stonefly. That's why I think this one is a little bit tricky, because when you first look at it, it looks like it has the two uh tails, right? Is that part of why you were thinking that one? Yeah, but then it only seems like two, but uh -huh. And then hiding kind of in the middle is the third tail. Uh, and you Harmony, can go ahead. Sorry, Harmony is saying mayfly. Yeah, so that is a tricky one. That's why I was saying that one is kind of tricky because um, those two tails on the outside really pop out. The one of center is a little hiding. Um, but the other thing you can notice is you can kind of see the gills along the body. So that's another way uh, to know that this is a mayfly because mayflies have gills along the abdomen and stoneflies do not. So great job, guys. All right, let's go down. And how about this one right here, now on my top right, but it was the second row down, far right. This must be a hard one. Nobody's guessed yet. <laughs> we'll give them a little bit more time. This one's not so much of a trick one, so <laughs> if that's helpful. Any guesses? And that one is a stonefly. So you see, you do see the two tails and you can kind of tell that you can't see any gills along the sides and it's a golden stonefly. Okay, so um, that's all we'll do together right now, but I would encourage you to go ahead and go through and do each one. And then you can either just, you know, click right here, submit by email and, and submit it that way, or you can email it to me directly. Um, I think Susan might be able to pop the my email address into the chat 
um, cali.c.sams at wv.gov. And let me pop back over to this. Um, we also have on the website an activity instead of submitting by email, you can just do it right on um, the website. So the way it works is you just click on one of those numbers. So you, these are each links and it pops up a picture. And then um, I guess you do actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. You still have to fill in the form and then you can submit it. We'll try to get that into a Google form here soon. That'll make it a little easier. So either one or both, uh, if you wanna go ahead and do those identification activities, and I do have some goodies that I can send you guys. Um, also on our website, you can look at upcoming workshops. If you would like to get your school or your group, whether it's 4-H or whoever you're with, um, set up, you could attend one that's already scheduled in your area uh, by looking at the Watershed Improvement Branches calendar and uh, seeing those Save Our Streams workshops. Or if you don't see one near you, um, just reach out and we can schedule one. Uh, let's see. And these are just some additional resources. This can all be found on our website. Our website has a lot of information. So if you want to get involved, um, you can start right away just by looking at the different resources on the website and then attend a workshop to get certified and start doing this right in your own watershed and your own community and check out what's living uh, where you're at. And we only have a couple more uh, minutes, so let me stop. Yeah, um, I've shared your email and the link and we'll put that up um, when we when we put up digitally copies of each presentation. And if you have a PDF of um, any of those pages that you shared or Word, we can link those as well. Okay, that sounds great. Anybody have any questions? Well, thank you, Susan. Put them in the thank chat. you everybody for joining. Great job there, Callie, thank you. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Love the bugs. Thanks, Harmony. It is fun. It's even more fun when we're out there in the stream. So I hope you'll sign up for one or get your group to schedule a workshop. Allie, when do our guys, our uh, field biologists who go out and sample the streams, are they mostly going out in the summer and spring or do they go out all year? I think, you know, it's obviously more comfortable <laughs> in the right. summer and spring. Right. Um, but I think they tend to go throughout the year as long as the yeah. weather conditions allow. Because, you know, even in the wintertime, sometimes we get some, you know, more, a little warmer weather. So if it's not too terrible, they'd be trying to get samples collected. So the Watershed Assessment Branch uh, with the DEP uh, has folks that they sent out and they're doing this and collecting this data and it gets sent to uh, not only collected for our state's use, but also sent to the EPA and goes into the federal database as well. I usually see them gathering their supplies in the morning. You know, they, they go out like it's like an army leaving the <laughs> fort to head out. There's five or six <laughs> trucks and, you know, they, they all have their equipment to, and it's usually in the summer or spring I see them but I didn't yeah. know if the water I'm obviously like you say it'd be less comfortable to do it in the winter but I didn't know if the water temperature played a part in the science. you can you can the, find them all year long because a lot of them do have life cycles that are longer than a year even three years I, in some cases gotcha. uh, so you can find these insects year long it's more just do you want to be in a stream in January yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Callie. That was so inform informative and good pictures and everything. I hope everybody will go to the to the worksheet and see if they can figure them out because that was kind of that was fun. Yes, send those in and inc remember to include your address because then I have some stuff I can send your way if you submit those. Awesome. Well, that I believe concludes our this last session and our day. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be having some final thoughts if you go back to the main session, but if not, you can feel free to log out. We will have stuff um, tomorrow starting again, I believe it's at nine. Yep, starting again and running from nine to one. So 
hopefully you've registered for some things for tomorrow. So we'll see everybody tomorrow. Thank Have you. a great rest see of the day. <laughs>